this Monday in October. Got a nice fiddler crab down there. How's it going, fella? Yeah, I see ya. You guys are so cool. Big claw, little claw. Fid the crab. I think it because it looks like you're holding the violin. He's gonna walk sideways away from me. Yeah. And uh I'm back out here on Cape Cod again. Which uh a lot nicer than uh last time I was out here. Of course right now it's uh October. It's been cold. It's uh fall. And uh, despite the fact that the Atlantic is just about as warm as it gets right now, uh, pretty uh, pretty deserted out here. And we'll uh, only get more deserted. And the uh, anti-suicide, suicide awareness, uh, suicide hotline numbers, probably shouldn't be talking about this on a YouTube video, on the uh, Sagamore Bridge, start making a lot more sense when you see, uh, you know, kind of the true nature of uh, Cape Cod, probably, I don't know what, six, seven, six seven even maybe even eight months out of the year when uh, no one's really out here and uh, everybody inhabiting the uh you know mansions like you see over there has uh, gone back to their second or third home that they own probably in connecticut or long island or greater boston area but uh you know i digress you you can see what could have uh, pushed somebody to such an extreme if you had to suffer the misery of a cape cod winter but anyway what we're out here to see or some plants, like usual. Uh, we already got some, I've already seen some interesting stuff. I've actually already seen the first plant that I wanted to show you today, which is a species of Bacchus, but um, kind of shrubbier ones. And uh, Bacchus, the uh, genus of um, sunflower, containing the only uh, arborescent, that is tree-like sunflower. Or I shouldn't say tree-like, the thing is, the thing is a tree, it's a small tree and it's a sunflower. You'll see it when we get to it. Uh, in the northeast, and I believe even just on the east coast in general, you've got some uh, plants, some plumbaginaceae down here. You've got a, a tentacle thing you're seeing is a, I think that's some sort of weird amaranthaceae. Well, we'll come back and we'll look at that um, just to determine what it is exactly what we've got going on. I saw these last time. Unfortunately, I missed um, seeing what was an interesting uh, species of plumbaginaceae in flower when I was here. Uh, back in the summer, but I digress. Yeah, Cape Confident and Doctrine, I'll give you the brief intro because we'll get into it. This is a uh, terminal moraine that is uh, a big pile of glacial sand that was uh, pushed up uh, basically at the edge of a um, glacier during the last period of glaciation. Cape Cod, Long Island, Martha's Vineyard, Dantucket, etc., are all uh, in that same category. Island. Oh, I guess you got. It's still kinda, kinda blooming. We'll come back. We'll talk about that. I gotta, I gotta. I took some notes down just in case I saw that again. Plumbaginaceae family. I haven't. Don't think I've talked about it at all in these videos. But anyway, so Cape Cod glacial sands deposited. Um, Cape Cod Bay would have at one point, presumably, I think, just been a giant uh, glacial lake. Essentially, I, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but nonetheless, these sands were deposited here relatively recently in terms of geologic time. Uh, you know, a couple ten, you're talking tens of thousands of years, not millions of years like you're typically talking with a, you know, geologic formations. But I digress. What that has allowed for, as we've seen in other, you know, similar areas in New England, are essentially just these builds up, build up of, uh, you know, sandy soils of which uh, are fast draining and despite the fact that this is not uh, a desert you get a, a host of species that are much more desert like looking like these uh junipers up here you junipers pitch pines you got oaks uh, and then of course you have the uh, only species of arctostaphylos which is all this low cover here arctostaphylos uva ursi which uh, has a very broad distribution you can find that guy everywhere but uh, colloquially known as manzanitas and uh quite uh species rich out west and uh this is kind of a long intro but you, you get what's going on here i was just listening to a freaking podcast about this as i was coming in what you going on up there well some kind of aster oh, i've been see, i've been seeing this guy we'll, we'll take a look at that aster when we come back coming up uh coming up out of the arctostaphylos that's nice um but we're gonna look at we're actually gonna 
I mean, yeah, you get Junipers, Virginiana growing everywhere, grows everywhere up here. But then you also got a really interesting, um, a real interesting, uh, uh, quote unquote cedar that forms a swamp type habitat and a different sort of microsite than this, which we'll go look at too. That's a Cama cypress, Cama cypress lioides. The tide might be coming in right now. Yeah, you can see this entire flat is just dominated by salt tolerant plants. This is just the uh, tide coming in right here. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, be, I'm being chatty right now. So we're we're gonna we're gonna drive all around. I'm not gonna spend too much time here, mostly because I didn't pay, and also because uh, I really just want to look at a species of bacchus, and we'll probably check out one or two other things. I'm going back to the car, but uh, yeah, just to give you an idea, what's go by and large what's going on in the Cape is uh, you have um, this buildup of sandy of uh, sandy soil. It's soil that's basically all sand, extremely nutrient poor. You have high levels of salt, obviously, because we are, you know, on the on the this is the Atlantic Ocean right here, uh, specifically the interior side. So this is looking out into Massachusetts Bay or Cape Cod Bay, whatever it's called, and then. Uh, back on the other side of the island would be where you're uh, where you're looking out into the Atlantic or actually there's a nice nice juniper right here Junipertus virginiana I, I think this is also they also call this a cedar they call this eastern red cedar of course bearing no relation to the genus cedrus that is a juniper um, genus cedrus of course being a uh, um, in the in the pine family panaceae and uh, junipers came cypress being in the redwood family cupressaceae and we're about to go by one of my good friends here yeah, here's that uh here's that cactus that grows wild this is a punchy humifusa if you're from the midwest you know you know about this cactus this is uh a punchy humifusa eastern prickly pear those little red things are the fruits right there maturing i missed this in flower when i was here earlier blooms in june and then um, blooms in June, ripens to the fall. You can eat those fruits if you pick off the glockids. This is, of course, Opunt Opunt Opuntioidae, the Opuntioidae subfamily of the family Cactaceae. So, you know, Opunches, uh, Cylinder Punches, Choyas. You get some real nasty customers in this, uh, in this family because a lot of them lack, you know, spines instead of having the uh, tiny little spines there and those aerials known as glockids and the um, structures they form. These little paddles are known as cladodes, which is also, um, I'm not sure if it's unique or if it's just uh, unique or common, whatever whatever you want to call it. But uh, yeah, get plenty of this guy out of the Cape because it likes the sand. It can tolerate the cold. Like many cacti, or like all cacti, if I'm wrong, just correct me. Again, this is the only species of cactus native to New England. This is the farthest northeast you find it growing. Um, I believe that, uh, general rule of thumb with cacti is that they can do the, uh, they can take the cold as long as they're dry and they can take being wet as long as they're hot. And in that way they balance each other out. Got a nice, uh, he's growing on top of the cactus, but he's going up here too with the fruits. Got a real nice member of Vitacea here, the Virginia creeper. Those are those fruits the birds love. Commonly mistaken for a, uh, for poison ivy just because it kind of grows like an ivy, also commonly accused of being an invasive species, but it's not. Um, this is a, you know, all over the East Coast, Virginia creeper, it's in the Vitaceae, the grape family. All right, I'm gonna take a break here. Uh, that backer should be right around the corner. I kind of want to get in and out of this location. Uh, there might be, this might even be it. I think this is that solid doggo. I'll come back to you on that. Let me double check. Like 40 species of solid doggo all going off right now. And uh, there's an interesting one, Semperverans, which should be growing here. It might be that plant right there. If it is, I'll, I'll talk about that because it's a cool one. In any case, um, you know, Punchyhimifusa, Junipurus virginiana, growing with a uh, <laughs> common plant of the East Coast. Um, that uh, uh, Parthenocystis kinkafolia is the common name of Virginia creeper, by the way. And uh, yeah, I think that's a good 10 minute intro. But uh, yeah, come to Cape Cod if you want to see cacti growing uh, 50 feet away from the Atlantic Ocean. All right, we're going to uh, check out some other stuff here, and uh, I'll get back to you. I'm going to go check out that Bacchus. There's a couple other asters, of which uh, Saldago Semperverans. Um, 
assuming it's here we'll talk about that and then uh yeah i kind of gave you a brief overview you want to go more in depth for this specific spot you can go back and check out my video that i did about that but uh you got a you got a nice uh nephali it probably maybe pseudo nephalium one of those ones i forget Double check on that too. Also, a member of the Asterix and the Paper Daisy Tribe. Really interesting. Again, I've got I've got stuff up on that, and I'm, I don't really feel like going in depth on that right now because we're gonna go look at yet another member of the family, Asteraceae. A second here. Oh, that's real nice. This guy's already opened. All right, that's enough of that. Okay, nice lady. We just walked by. We were talking about this plant for a second here. So this isn't quite arborescent, but this guy's maybe maybe seven eight. Eh, maybe nine feet tall. And I say guy because Bacris, uh, God, I'm going to butcher it. Is it Hamalifolia? Hamalifolia? Uh, I'll put the correct name down below. Also known as Saltbrush. Also known as Coyote Bush. Although I think the entire genus is uh, known as Coyote Bush. So there's a few species of Bacris. This is the farthest north growing species is this particular one. Um, I believe they also get this in Europe and it goes all the way down into Mexico. And... Like I said, member of Asteraceae, so you've still got, you know, your compound compound flowers. So this one's a male. The species is dioecious, so you get male and female flowers on different plants. So those are the, uh, come here, staminate male flowers that would focus. There you go. And then on this plant over here, you've got the pistillate female flowers. And the little pappus there is your giveaway because that's uh, aiding in seed dispersal. So these aren't two different species in different phases of, uh, or not different species, these aren't two different plants in a different phase of uh, phenology. These are just two different sexes. So the female flowers will always have these uh, white bottle brush looking uh, sort of poofs on them. And then I believe the female flowers also, if you get in there, you look at the filaries. Come on, where are we going here? Females also have those uh, little streaks of purple in there, which I didn't really see on the male on the on the filaries of the male plant. And uh, yeah, kind of unlike a lot of other dioecious plants I've come across, usually the male flowers are the ones that are kind of almost more showy, just because they've got all the stamens packed in there. But of course, with Asteraceae, you got to remember we're dealing with multiple tiny little flowers on each one of these little flower heads here. So I forget how it works if each one of these is going down to an akeen, a little sunflower fruit or whatnot, but uh, doing the plumose thing that most sunflowers do. Of course, ecologically speaking, I'm pretty sure Bacchus gets uh, frequented by bugs. I mean, I can see some little flies and stuff flying around it now. Uh, it does quite well in these sort of salt marsh habitats. You can see this is all, all those little white poofs are these female, female Bacchus plants, not quite as big as uh, this male has gotten here. But a uh, real interesting plant, uh, I don't think you get it much north of here. Maybe on Cape Ann in some spots, but it's all over the place here. And then as you go down the coast, it's uh, quite common. Um, actually, no, I'm full of shit. Th what's going on with this plant is now you do get it inland up here in New England because of the road salt. They put the road salt down. That's my, that was my angle there. They put the road salt down. So along roadsides, you get these gullies and ditches. You get all that salt accumulating, washing off. And uh, they're able to kind of set up shop there in the gullies along the sides of roads now, which is real interesting because obviously if you can tolerate salt, you've got a uh, competitive edge against other plants around you. We'll take a look at those leaves there. Kind of nice. They uh, look a little different on the uh, inflorescence. And then as you go down the branch... They kind of get that lobed, that lobed thing. So Bacchus is a wonderful genus. Um, this is your one you can look at if you're up here in New England. Of course, I didn't need to come all the way down to the Cape to see it, but I mean these ones are growing much larger. I've seen some smaller ones growing, like little uh, little shrubs. But uh, yeah, this this could be considered a. I mean, this is a large shrub, but they definitely do get up to be you know the size of like a uh, of a small tree. In fact, uh, there's one right there. It looks like it was a at one point much larger, certainly thicker than this one, and had a, a branch break off. So maybe that one was uh, it's already taller than this one because they're at the same height. That one's a foot downhill, so I could see that thing being you know 10 15 feet tall before it broke off there. But uh, 
All right, we're going to keep going. There's some cool other cool asters to look at. And like I said, we're going to go check out a quote-unquote white cedar swamp. And we'll see what's going on over there. But uh, yeah, one last shot of a uh, Bacris. Bacris hamamifolia. I keep wanting to say like hamamiladacea, but I don't think that's correct. Like a witch hazel. I don't think that's where it gets its name. So uh, we'll keep going. Yeah. Shout out to Bacchus, wonderful plant. Interesting, fascinating for its uh for both its family and what it's doing. Okay, my my mistake. Scientific name for this guy is Bacchus halimifolia. There's an L in there. I forgot. Uh Amamalus virginiana is another plant. There's a cute little chipmunk down there. You probably can't even see him staring right at me. Uh Hamamalus virgini virginiana is witch hazel. That's a plant I'm going to go see soon because that's blooming right now too. But the halimifolia is the species I put that here. And the common name for this one specifically is actually groundsel tree. Groundsel is the common name for uh, Senecio. And uh, I guess they thought it was a, a, a Senecio looking tree. I think they thought this was in the genus Senecio at one point. But uh, it's not. It's in the genus Bacchus. All right. I just had to double check my work there just to make sure I wasn't, you know, wasn't completely wrong as I sometimes am and I'm not afraid to admit. All right, we're going to go look at a couple of these purple asters and uh, uh, we'll go see if we'll go see if our friend uh, uh, Saldago Semperverens is out here somewhere. Oh, hey, he's still going off. I'm going to put a, uh, a video I haven't edited at the time I'm filming this, but uh Nonetheless, uh, my first video from Cape Cod, I came across this plant just by chance, and I won't talk too much about it now, because I'll pretend as though I put a whole bunch of information in the past. Here is yet another, if you're detecting a theme here, cool member of Asteraceae. This is Pityopsis falcata. This is actually a pretty rare and restricted range plant. It just looks like a little unassuming yellow, uh, little yellow guy with the lanceolate leaves there, uh, with some minute hairs on the underside, and then, uh, yeah, somewhat, somewhat run of, ah, it's values are kind of cool. Kind of got a long, kind of get a long, narrow thing going on there with the phyleries. Kind of like that. But a Pityopsis falcata is another one of these uh, plants in a category of plants that just um, really, really seem to uh, like the sandy stuff up here on the East Coast. So you get some plants like a Sabatia kennediana grows uh, in the coastal ponds here. And then you also get it on like the Sandy Barrier Islands down in the Carolinas in Virginia. Um, just a fan of the sand. But this one's even more restricted than that. This uh, is quite abundant here on Cape Cod. And I guess they get it on Long Island and in Jersey. And that's just about it for its range. So I guess you could say it's a, you know, endemic to the sandy islands of uh, the Northeast. Uh, I don't really know much about the ecology yet, but I just know that, you know, it's uh, setting up shop where it doesn't really seem to have to compete with anything else. It can grow in the salty, in the dry, sandy, salty stuff where other stuff can't. So uh, it's easing what it would, sorry, let me back up. Essentially what it lacks in its ability to directly compete by getting big or crowding stuff out, it makes up for and its ability to tolerate stuff. Not, other, not anything else can tolerate. But uh, yeah, a couple flowers left. This was going, this was just starting to go off in July. It's October now, but I mean, a lot of these, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm incorrect to say a lot of these asters can, you know, hang on for quite a while. You'll still see them having a couple flowers, you know, uh, towards the very end of the fall. And as you can see, just like with Bacchus, you still got the puffballs. There are the seeds right there. The Akeens. Akeen is just the, uh, what a sunflower fruit is called. I think other stuff's got Akeens too, but you can see how, how you know, clearly it's almost done. Spent the whole summer flowering. Some of these have looked gone and dried out for a while and some of these still have some really good seed in them so he'll be able to spread around and do his thing for the uh you know wind dispersed yeah i guess i talked a lot about it but whatever sometimes you get to hear this stuff more than once for it to click not everyone's going to watch every video this is a cool plant i just never really for, for for something that's so range restricted and seemingly rare outside of uh just cape cod uh i don't really see anybody talk about it kind of I'd imagine just because it's just an un, an, yet another unassuming little yellow composite flower, but whatever. Okay, just like solid doggo bicolor and solid doggo macrophylla. Here's here's a solid doggo. I mean, all solid doggos are nice. Here's one worth pulling over for. 
a little, little bee on there. How cute is that? This is uh, what I believe to be Salt Douglas Semperverens, the Northern Seaside Goldenrod, or Salt Marsh Goldenrod, or whatever, and uh, doing what he does best, growing uh, in the salty, sandy soil on the edge of a salt marsh. Uh, I, you know, I was trying to tell me this is a showy goldenrod. Um, yeah, showy goldenrod and uh, this one, which is, a, I think it's all, not altissima, it's tall goldenrod, whatever. A different species of goldenrod is what it thought this was. Um, however, upon consulting an actual book, you know, an actual flora that I had in my backpack, uh, this has really fleshy, almost succulent leaves. And that is a pretty good diagnostic factor that this is solid doggo sempervirens. Not a lot of the uh, solid doggos have um, smooth entire margins like that. And then uh, euthamia, which um, can have you know smooth entire margins like that, which I didn't think this is. Which I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I love euthamias, euthamia caroliniana, and uh, what's the other one there? Euthamia gramnifolia are both lovely plants that probably grow somewhat close by to here but this alas is not that this is solid douglas sempervirens and uh one could take a guess that that mild succulence that it seems to have is probably a pretty good adaptation to growing where uh, you're losing a lot of moisture in your soil or i should say your soil's not holding a lot of moisture so therefore you got to hold onto it and um you know, perhaps a good adaptation for uh, just being kind of exposed. But, you know, solid dog was usually growing pretty exposed. It's not universally true. There's plenty of solid dog that grow in woodlands, too. Um, you know, macrophile is one that I've seen growing in the woods. And then there's plenty of other species that I've seen just growing in the forest. Bicolor, I saw growing kind of on the edge of a woodland. Um, but, yeah. So we're just enjoying the habitat here. Someone was letting a chainsaw rip across the, uh, across the little... Uh, marsh over there but uh like i said maybe maybe check out two other things you can see more of that solid dog go back there maybe check out two or three more things and we'll get out of here okay i come to this spot we got we got some good stuff going on we're in kind of a little cut yeah we'll start here with this guy so here's here's that arctostaphylos i didn't talk that much about it before it's arctostaphylos uva ursi Again, only manzanita you get on the East Coast. Lots of species of Arctostaphylos in California, though. Tons of them. Uh, really, really unfriendly, waxy, tough leaves. And then there's the actual uh, fruit there. A uh, little ursula. Oh, he just popped right off. So, uh, Ericaceae. I don't believe you can eat these, though. Crack that open. It's all mealy on the inside. Uh, the birds love them, though. I believe that it's dispersed by birds or bears or whatever. You get the idea. But it's in the same family as, you know... Blueberries, um, rhododendrons, even the monotropes, you know, all those guys. I forget exactly which subfamily it's in. This might even be in um, Ericoideae. Like, it might be in the same subfamily as, uh, you know, or Vacciniae. I think it's in Vacciniae. And as you can see, it even kind of, its growth habit even kind of reminds me of what a cranberry does. Uh, I guess if you didn't know any better, you'd think New England, you come down, you see those. You might think it's a cranberry. But it's in the same family as cranberry. It might even be in that subfamily, Ericoidae. Don't quote me on that just yet. I'll put the correct info down below. Um, lovely mushroom right there, too, coming up with these flowers. Surprised it's uh, coming up in the sand like that. Um, where was he? Over here, you've got a... Uh, oh, they call this the... Uh, what is it? wax leaf aster or something? I, I literally just forgot. It's not a Symphiotrichum. Unlike everything else, Symphiotrichum or, uh, uh, or Saudago, like everything else seems to be. Is it, not Linocera. Is it Linocera? Hang on one second. Well, this guy, Linactus linarii folia, and I'm sorry, not the wax-leaved aster, the flax-leaved aster. And indeed, it does have a very, very tough and somewhat pointy leaves on it that as you uh, go up towards the inflorescence, turn into these uh, somewhat sharp bracts. Get a good shot of the filaries there for you. Those ray florets. Got an ant. And then those disc florets in the center. Lanactus. Genus I'm not familiar with. I just came across this. I thought this was cool. I thought it was another Symphiotrichum. What is another Symphiotrichum? Are all these white guys here. Kind of looks a little bit like our pal uh, Symphiotrichum racemosum. But it's not. This is a uh, Symphiotrichum ericoides. And like with most asters, 
those fineries there, the giveaway, that sort of milky white color to them. And also the flowers are a little bit smaller, actually quite a bit smaller than a Cynthia trichum race mosum, and it's not getting nearly as big as I've seen Cynthia trichum race mosum get. Uh, nonetheless, a lovely aster. Got a small juniper here laden with uh, juniper cones. Tempted to say juniper pears, you can have the mushroom back there. Huh. Evidently the mushrooms do just fine over here. But uh, I digress. Um, yeah, you got a little juniper covered in berries there for a little guy. Across the way, of course, another big backrest. And then we've got the, oh, I really hope I don't screw this up. No, I'm not screw screwing this up. In the order of Figales, and in the family Miracaceae, you've got a bayberry here. This is the northern bayberry. This is Mirica Pennsylvanica. Those are those berries there. Really waxy and hard. And if you actually take one, you kind of, you'll crush it a little bit betwixt your fingers there. See the seeds coming out? It smells absolutely delightful that is the smell i associate if you ever buy one of those beach scented candles or uh or um you know i guess beach scented candle oh it smells absolutely delightful waxy foliage deciduous so it does drop the leaves and this is uh the closest relative we've come across to a uh, comptonia peregrina my close uh, friend and associate one of my favorite plants uh in it i guess makes sense for this to um Similarly smell great just like Com Tony does. In fact, they kind of smell similar. This is sweeter and if you could smell it It's bayberry. You you know what bayberry smells like. This is Mirica Pennsylvanica If I didn't already say that you get a southern bayberry too um, And I think this is the only uh, Or do you get an arborescent Mirica? I don't I don't know. I don't know much about Miracaceae I wish I should because I love Comptonia. It's actually a pretty small family um, wax myrtles is the common name and I guess I mean they produce a lot of waxy compounds those berries are uh, really waxy the leaves almost have a little bit of waxiness to them but uh yeah, you still get your solid little ones because they're growing kind of in the shade still get the solid doggo oh what's this over here is this another Symphio trichum yeah I think this is a uh, big big wasp there that I don't want to screw with oh He's coming out of the flower. I don't think this is, could this be also be Aracoides? It might be. It's certainly another simple trick. I'm maybe just growing a little bit more healthy than the one over there. But the uh, wasps seem to have a monopoly on that one. So, uh, yeah, why don't we go check out that uh, Plumbaginaceae? You can get a love back. It's a beautiful plant. Go check out that Plumbaginaceae. And we'll uh, kick rocks over to the Camasapra Swamp. Go check out some of the stuff going on over there. And we'll uh, be on our merry way here. Is this the, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, these sodago leaves can get pretty big. But what a lovely plant. God, is that one fasciated? Yeah, maybe not. All right, I'm gonna have to grab a sandwich here at some point too. But uh, yeah, all this stuff just growing here because it's sandy. All, that's what all these plants seem to have in common. They all love that uh, sandy substrate. But, um, yeah, you know, really what they got to do is they got to clear this out because this is just a wasteland and they got to build a fucking uh, beach resort right here, you know, I'm being really sarcastic. They shouldn't do that at all. This is a wonderful habitat and uh, quite uncommon for the region. Anyway, all right, we'll go, uh, go probably check that one last plant out. We'll get out of here. Maybe they towed my car. That'd be really funny. So I very nearly uh, got stuck on the side of the trail I was on just because that tide, uh, the tide sure did come in. Oh, what you get there? Is that that salt marsh aster? Maybe actually. If that's what I think it is, that's a Symphio trichum, believe it or not. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll await uh, further approval because that, I was just reading about that a second ago. Check out this uh, juniper. Cooper says here, remember, not a cedar. Even though it's called an eastern red cedar, it's a, it's, a, it's a redwood growing almost in the Atlantic Ocean. How about that? All right, I'm going to figure out the best way to get myself uh, back over to where I need to be. And uh, we'll carry on from there. But this, this, if this is what I think it is, I'm thoroughly impressed by this plant. But uh, I don't know. Pending further approval. Let me take some pictures. Not a plant I heard of before. I just read about it in a book like two seconds ago and I was trying to find out something else. Oh, look at the little fish. Hopefully you can see those cute little guys. So I was mistaken. This is actually that. This is actually that Plumbaginaceae. Just this one is uh, 
this one's done. I saw when we walked in. Hope, hopefully, I got an okay video shot of that because that's the best we're going to get, I think. The little purple flowers on this. This is Limonium Caroliniana. Carolinium, I, whatever. Carolina is the species epithet, and then whatever the proper Latin rules are, you would apply to that. Um, but Limonium. Hope I'm saying that right too, is the genus on this. This is the plant I was talking about in Plumbaginaceae. So this thing can just grow right in salt water, as you can clearly see. Uh, and I mean, actually, there's plenty of it out around here. It, it was going off, starting to go off when I was here in July. And then I guess it's a July, August thing. So it's been done for a while. There was one plant I saw come in as a straggler. I should have just stopped there to talk about it. But uh, here you go, and you can see clearly that uh, it's doing its thing. Plumbaginaceae, I believe, is a family full of a lot of salt-tolerant uh, plants, much like Amaranthaceae. Um, I don't know much about them, but I'll, I'll, if I really come across anything striking, I will, um, you know, maybe edit over this or maybe just add a little segment at the end. But uh, Plumbaginaceae is the family. Um, Limonium, Caroliniens, Carolinium, however, it's properly pronounced in the Carolina Sea Lavender. So it's called, of course, obviously bear absolutely no relation to lavender. And uh, basically growing along a strip just along uh, coastal um, tidal flats like this. Uh, all the way down to Mexico, I think. And then all the way up into uh, the Canadian Maritime. So widely distributed, but only right on the coast. I don't, I don't think this goes into estuaries. I think it grows in a, just a salt flat like this. All right, um, that might be really the last thing I have to show you, really the last thing I can show you. Um, oh, yeah, here's, here's what I was talking about. See, here's those bean pods you get on those locust-type trees. The base, yeah, it's still just a bean, a lot of tree beans. Crack it open. There's the seed. This guy looks like hell. Maybe he just already dropped his leaves. But, uh, yeah, I think that'll, I think that'll do it for, for over here for right now. Why don't we uh, why don't we get on out of here? All those little fish darting everywhere. They see my shadow and they run from the shadow. It's kind of cute, but uh, I digress. We will uh, get on out of here. Look at him go! Man on a mission right there. Did I lose him? I can't see. I can't see the video. If there's not a fair, he is. I was gonna say. I really do like the fitter crabs, man. Just oh what, what? He's all pissed off. All right, let's go look at a. Uh, we're gonna go from the uh, from a tide flat, salt marsh, salt flat. The fish are everywhere, man. Look at him go. If I'm freaking them out, I feel kind of bad, but it's kind of funny. They don't like shadows. That's the thing I always found out when I used to go. I used to go camp near this little river. We'd go fish with like little nets, catch the minnows and stuff. And, uh, you know, they don't, they don't like, they see a shadow, they freak out. But, um, oh man, yeah, you can see the tide comes right up in here. Oh, is, a full, is there a full moon going on right now? Is that why it's coming up so high? I think I'll be fine. I'm already back to where back to where the official quote unquote official trail is. So uh yeah, let's go look at a uh I'm not gonna say cedar swamp. Well we did look at a goddamn I'll talk about it when we get there. We'll talk about it when we get there. But I'm 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 said I confused. I wanna know I wanna see that simple trick him now, that salt marsh aster. Yeah. As you can see, you know. I don't know what it's like in your area, but in New England, you get some nice, uh, you do get some nice plants in the coastal communities, you know? Get some nice stuff. Last, last thing, because I'm always neglecting the oaks. You've got Quercus pernoides here, the dwarf chinkapin oak. All right. Of course, chinkapins are in the genus Castanea, along with chestnuts. Um, this is uh, in the genus Quercus with the oaks, specifically uh, section Quercus 
genus Quercus, so it's a high latitude oak and it's a white oak, as opposed to uh, one of these over here, which is a variety of red oak. Uh, oaks are an absolute clusterfuck, and I'm just trying to kind of approach them with a sense of uh, grace and nuance, otherwise I risk losing my mind. But uh, unlike a lot of the red oaks, or even white oaks in the region, this is more of a shrubby oak, which is actually... If I'm understanding correctly, the habit that most oaks tend to grow in is these shorter, shrubbier plants uh, down in uh, Mexico, you know, high latitude, high altitude Mexico out there in the southwest. They get a lot more of these shrubby oaks. And then at northern latitudes out here in the east, we get a lot of the big water loving, specifically white oaks are the water loving ones. And then, of course, you get the red oaks too, doing their whole thing. Look at this fancy guy. No clue uh, what species of moth that is. Beautiful though. What do you pollinate, friend? Huh? That's okay. Thank you for your time. You know, I know I'm beating you out over the head with this spot, and this really isn't an out of the way spot. This is, you know, pretty accessible hiking trail, but you can see how you know areas of the Cape they, they dry out so quick because of the sand. You can see how a really, really easy for a fire dependent community to kind of form here. It's a bit different than uh bit different than your standard sort of you know pine barren that you can get inland on some shallow soil uh, because there's you know a different uh the climate here is different this is an oceanic climate not a temperate climate it's different a little less moisture temperature stays a bit more constant much less snow here than you get you know uh 60 miles west of here inland but um yeah you can just see how you could drop a match and this would go up in flames it's n nothing like uh just a, you know, coastal heathland. That's the word I'm looking for. Coastal heathland, although this is a little bit different. This is more of a, of a, this is actually probably just considered a pine barren. Coastal heathland, you get some cool members of Cystaceae there, like Hudsonia, um, cro uh, what is it? Crocanthemum, not Crocanthemum. Uh, no, yeah, Crocanthemum. Um, some of those guys, just uh, Cystaceae, the rock rose family. Some really cool plants from there. Uh, of course, the, the, the heathland comes from, uh, you know, those heath-like plants. Um, not all of them being an Ericaceae. Heath is uh, an Erica. This is a genus, which is Ericaceae. It's actually the type genus for Ericaceae. But uh, I'm talking about something we're not even looking at. We're, we're going we're gonna to check out some of those Cystaceae plants. You get a really cool um, a biome where you get Arctostaphylos uva ursi. You get a crocanthum, a rare crocanthum species. I think it's actually endemic to... Uh, Pretty much endemic to Cape Cod, the islands, and then maybe Cape Cod and a couple other spots. And then you get a Hudsonia tomentosa, and Hudsonia is a really cool genus in and of itself. I think there's only like three species, two of them you get up here, and you get one down in the Carolinas. But uh, again, I shouldn't be talking about stuff we don't know. I'm just further, let me zoom out a little bit, you get the wide angle. Just showing you how this is not your typical run-of-the-mill oak pine woodland you would get inland. Uh, it's a, you, get, you get some other stuff going on here. You definitely get some other stuff going on here.